Very pleased to have with us in studio right now, Katie Pavlich from townhall.com. How are you doing tonight, Katie? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Excellent. Glad you could join us this evening. As always, I'm glad to be here. A lot of uh, new developments in uh, Operation Fast and Furious to talk about, including uh, Lanny Brewer's testimony yesterday before uh, a, a Senate subcommittee. And, you know, he didn't really say anything new. I mean, like all of the bombshells kind of came out the night before when right. he admitted, you know, I heard about this gun walking stuff in uh, 2010 and I didn't say anything to anybody about it. Well, I want to point out something that's very important here. And that is, okay, so you have Lanny Brewer, Assistant Attorney General, now coming out and saying, yeah, I knew about gun walking um, back in 2010. What happened to the whistleblowers who came out and said, hey, they're, they're walking guns into Mexico and they're not tracing them. They were ridiculed. They were retaliated against. They were told that they were incompetent to be working at ATF anymore. Mm -hmm. They were they were berated by the media as, as being you know falsely claiming that these things were happening, that the administration would dare allow thousands of guns to go into the hands of violent criminals. I mean, they were put on the chopping block, and they were the ones who were held up as the, the redheaded stepchild of, of the ATF and of the DOJ. And it's yeah. absolutely unbelievable now that that Lanny Brewer is coming out and admitting, oh, I knew about it, and the whistleblowers have been thrown completely under the bus and given no credit for this when they were accurate from the very beginning. They're the ones who exposed this entire thing, and they're the ones who have received the most wrath in their jobs, in their family. It was very brave for them to come forward. And now all of a sudden, Lanny Brewer is getting passed by the media and everyone else by saying, oh, yeah, by the way, I knew about it when whistleblowers were telling us a long time us a long time ago this was happening and you guys were saying they were incompetent and they were mm -hmm. making stuff up it's unbelievable to me you know it, it really is and you know i'll tell you something else that's unbelievable uh lanny brewer saying that the reason why he never put two and two together that uh he heard about this gun walking in uh, operation wide receiver which took place during the bush administration uh and he he had, he had heard about fast and furious but Everybody involved in Fast and Furious, they denied that any gun walking was taking place. So he just let it go. He just, he, oh, okay. Right. Now, in some cases, we're talking about the very same people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are the same people. William Newell, William McMahon, David Voth, um, Dennis Burke in the you know, U.S. Attorney's Office who has since resigned. Uh -huh. I mean, all the same players within ATF are still there, A, some of them have been promoted, even though ATF is claiming they're, they're not promotions, Cam. They were right. simply moves. Um, you're absolutely right. They're the same players. They've been in place, and they were the same people who were there for wide receiver and they're f there for Operation Fast and Furious as well. And, and so Lanny Brewer's excuse is, uh, even though these people who, who did this in wide receiver, and I found it very troubling, I just didn't say anything to anybody. Uh, and when they told me that they weren't doing it in Fast and Furious, I just believed them. Yeah. Lanny, look, if Lanny Brewer had a reputation of being a moron, <laughs> I mean, if he was the Forrest Gump of, of you know, the D.C. Uh, political scene, right. then maybe that would be believable. But he's not a stupid man. Well, show me the evidence that shows you didn't know, that you didn't know guns were being walked. Because all the evidence shows uh -huh. that you knew exactly what was going on. Right. And there's maps that show the direction of where these guns were going, mm -hmm. being, being, dating back to 2010. And I think it's very uh, interesting how he stressed, you know, during Operation Wide Receiver, I was very, very concerned about the grave mistakes that were made under the Bush administration. But I just didn't decide to do anything about it when, you know, four times as many <laughs> weapons were being trafficked under the Obama administration, and there was no effort to trace those guns during Operation Fast and Furious, which is different than Wide Receiver. You know, under Wide Receiver, the Mexican government knew what was going on. Under Operation Fast and Furious, they didn't know what was going on. So for him to act like, eh, just, even though I had major problems with it, I just decided not to say anything when he's Attorney General Holder's right-hand man mm -hmm. is is ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, I mean, again, it just it just does not pass the uh, the smell test to me. Um, <laughs> like everything else that we've seen in this thing, this uh, this uh, scandal outside of what the whistleblowers have told us, right? Right, exactly. They're the only ones we can trust. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll see what happens next week when Holder testifies before the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, right. I'm sure that there'll be some fireworks, but I also think that Holder is gonna he's gonna continue to play dumb, and uh, I, I'm I'm looking forward to his explanation about the. The, the, the timeline of events, right. however, uh, him saying back in May that, oh, I, don't, I just learned about this a few weeks ago, and Obama, President Obama saying back in March uh, that, that he could state that he knew nothing about it, he didn't authorize it, Attorney General Holder didn't authorize this. When did they start talking about Fast and Furious? Well, not to mention the five memos that were addressed <laughs> directly to Attorney General Eric Holder. Not, not His name wasn't you know mentioned in passing from someone, you know, I briefed Holder on this. 
directly addressed to the Attorney General of the United States nearly a year before he admitted in testimony in May that uh, he knew about it. But Katie, we've already we've already <laughs> been told that uh, you know he doesn't read everything that comes across his desk. That's why he has a staff, mm -hmm. and it's the staff's fault if there was something that they should have highlighted that he should have been aware of. I mean, again, the, you know, just just listening to their excuses and listening right. to what they are are telling us. Right. What they're telling us is that they're horrible at their jobs. Right. That apparently they go to work and they do everything but oversee the Justice Department. And they're also telling us that they have no no moral compass whatsoever because if the staff were really the only ones who were reading through these memos about guns being walked into Mexico, do not forget that a you know, guns being found at crime scenes in Mexico by William, you know, William Newell said that was a, a, a result of the program actually working. Mm -hmm. Those those guns being right. being found at violent crime scenes in Mexico. So let's not forget that. But if if they've been seeing this documentation of Fast and Furious coming through in these memos and the memos, you know, they tried to claim weren't detailed. They're detailed enough that you would, would know what was going on for the staff not to red flag that and say, you know, Attorney General, this might be something you want to look into. It looks pretty serious. They're incompetent, too. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, that, uh, bottom line, I, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And, you know, you, you talk about a, a lack of moral compass. I know that you also wrote on uh, Town Hall today about uh, this incident on MSNBC yesterday where right. uh, Sheriff Wright <laughs> uh, from Spartanburg County, South Carolina, was talking with uh, – uh, who was who was this guy? Craig, Craig Melvin. Melvin, yes, the fill-in host on MSNBC. The exchange went something like this. Sheriff, thanks for joining me. You called the guy an animal. You said that the suspect was lucky someone with the gun did not hear the victim crying and, quote, fix this. Are you suggesting that women should, uh, should, should be shooting to kill, for lack of a better word, down there? You, uh, mm -hmm. you also suggest which type of gun that women uh, should, should get. 45 caliber handgun. Why is that? It's called the judge. It shoots a 45 caliber or a 410 shotgun shell. Um, you don't have to be very accurate. You just have to be in the general vicinity. If, if women are shooting potential attackers, aren't they presuming guilt before innocence? What if a woman kills an attacker? Isn't that opening another whole legal can of worms? Well, I can. it's easy to fix that. Just don't attack a woman. <laughs> now, I love the sheriff's <laughs> response. Yeah. Uh, and the sheriff had some pretty... Uh, <laughs> Pretty interesting things to say about uh, Mr. Melvin when he was on this program yesterday. But I, I'm curious. I mean, we, uh, listening to this MSNBC host say, you know, look, I mean, what, what, what gives a woman a right to, in essence, defend oh. herself against a rapist? This had me fuming. For him to think that he has the right to act like women defending themselves against rapists and sympathizing with them and acting like someone who may have the potential of being raped, that they're presuming guilt instead of innocence. Let me give you this, this scenario. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Rapist, who's in my house at 2 in the morning. Are you going to rape me? Oh, you don't want to tell me? Let me just call the police real <laughs> fast to see if you know they can come and take care of the situation. Yeah. No, and his ignorance surrounding the entire idea of concealed carry was astounding to me. I guess I shouldn't be surprised considering he's living in, you know, Connecticut and works in New York City. But, um, you know, when you go through the course, you understand, especially as a woman, whether, you know, the feminist or anyone else wants to accept it or not, mm. men are stronger than women. And so women need something else to really protect themselves, whether it's in their homes, on the street. And yes, you shoot to kill. Because if you shoot someone in the knee and they get really upset with you and then they grab your gun from you, guess what they're going to do? They're going to shoot you with it. And you're going to be the one who ends up dead. They teach you in the concealed carry course that if, if you're going to make the ultimate decision, which should be the last resort, but if you feel that your life is in danger and this is something you have to do, that's what they teach you to do. So his ignorance surrounding the entire thing was absolutely astounding. But the whole idea, you know, that he was sympathizing with rapists and acting like you shouldn't be able to defend yourself was just ridiculous to me. Well, well and, and you even pointed out uh, something that we didn't uh, clip that we didn't share uh, at the beginning of this interview. He said, "Quote, uh, Sheriff, if law enforcement is charged with protecting the public, then 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 why should that not be sufficient? Why should folks have to go out and get guns and arm themselves if we've got cops?" Right. You know, the whole. This, I'm sure all <laughs> of your listeners know the saying. You know, when seconds count, the cops are minutes away. Right. And it goes back to the whole idea of entitlement. I'm entitled for the police to come take care of me. This isn't my problem. It's not my problem that there's a rapist in my home wanting to, you know, either rape me or kill me, which is right. worse. Um, you know, they think that someone else should always take care of them. And that's not the case, especially when it comes to self-defense. And the best part, I think, in that clip, which I'm not sure if we, we, we did show it, but the, the sheriff recommending the 45 caliber, 
you know, he was just shocked that the sheriff would even recommend a certain kind of, of gun or caliber to use. And it's like, what do you expect people to use? Spitballs or rubber band guns to deter, you know, uh, these thinking, uh, people uh, out of your home? Tongue depressors. And, right. And you vomit on your attack. <laughs> right. I just don't. I mean, what is he? It was like, he just it made zero sense to me. Well, it, it did. And, you know, I, and I, I again, I, I, I don't know what uh, uh, I guess Sheriff's right response to that. Uh, he said, you know, we can't be everywhere. We're a fool if we tell everybody that we can take care of uh, all, all our problems. Um, you know, you could also point out to Mr. Melvin that the Supreme Court has ruled right. uh, in Castle Rock versus Gonzalez a few years ago that the police do not have an obligation to protect you, right. the individual. Exactly. There was a famous case out of Washington, D.C., um, the uh, Warren decision, uh, which happened in the early 80s. Two women were basically uh, victims of a home invasion. They were sexually assaulted in their home for a period of 14 hours. Mm. They made multiple calls to 911, and the police showed up, Shine the flashlight. They, you know, never went in, never knocked on the door, never did anything. These women sued, mm -hmm. and the D.C. Court of Appeals ruled that, no, police don't have an obligation to protect you as an individual from any harm that may come to you. Right. They're there to protect and serve the community. So if you want to – look, so if the police don't have that responsibility, then where does that responsibility lie? With the it lies with us. Exactly. Right. I always say, you know, you have a, a choice is yours. Do you want to be a victim or not? And the choice really is yours. I mean, ultimately, the decision comes down to, am I going to allow someone to declare war on my person, come into my home, rape me or kill me? Or am, am I going to take steps to deter these people from coming in and attacking me or even on the street? I mean, the whole point that he missed, too, is that carrying concealed and stati statistics sh show this and mm -hmm. even being able to own a handgun in general um, show that the crime rates drop because... The idea that an attacker thinks that he may actually go into a home and and, and see some, um, I guess, you know, defense, he's not going to really, he's going to think twice about going into your home and trying to mess with you then. And it, I mean, being armed is a deterrent. The statistics show it. And it was just very clear that uh, Mr. Melvin either has an anti-gun agenda, which I wasn't, you know, wouldn't be surprised about, or he's just completely uh, ignorant when it comes to what a woman's rights are when it comes to defending herself. I, or anyone I, in general. You yeah, know? I know. I mean, I kind of, I kind of hope that uh, the 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 special woman in Mr. Melvin's life uh, greeted him yesterday and hi, honey, how was your day? Uh, <laughs> by the way, happened to see that interview with the sheriff. What do you mean? Yeah, what do you mean? What we do should, you mean uh, that assume? if I'm shooting a potential attacker, aren't I presuming guilt before yeah. innocence? At what point, darling, am I allowed to protect myself? Yeah. I mean, you know, really. It, it, I, I think that he saw this in such a, a theoretical term, and he never thought about the the real women mm -hmm. who are victims of sexual assaults, right. uh, who actually you know may want to protect themselves, may not want to uh, be a rape victim, right. may want to actually try to be uh, a, an armed citizen instead. Right. Well, Jessica Roth of Bond Girl Boot Camp is a perfect example of that. You know, she was kidnapped, sexually assaulted, left on the side of the road to die, and mm -hmm. guess what she did? She decided to arm herself, learn how to defend herself, and now she has an entire company dedicated to making sure women know how to defend themselves. And, um, it, you know, his idea that, you know, you're presuming guilt. Yes. If someone is in my <laughs> home and they're trying to rape me, I'm pretty sure they're guilty. I'm not going to take a second and think about, well, maybe they're just, maybe they don't mean this. Well, maybe they don't mean to be raping me right now. They're just, they're just, they're just, they're some, they just don't know what they're doing. They're making a mistake. Well, this was, I, I think, one of the other idiotic statements that he made is, you know, if you go through your concealed carry course, if you, you know, get training, you understand that there are conditions that have to be met before exactly. you can actually act in self-defense. You have to be in a reasonable fear of uh, death or grave mm -hmm. bodily injury. So it's not a matter of, Oh, that guy looks suspicious. I'm going to plug him. Right. Uh, exactly. You know, I know he's uh, you know four blocks down the street, but I don't like the uh, the cut of his jib. But but that was sort of what what uh, this anchor was suggesting, Craig Melvin, that you know, oh, if you just don't like the way somebody's looking at you. Uh, you can go and shoot him. No. And we don't want women to do that. Well, we don't have a problem with that yeah. in this society. We've got more than six million right to carry holders around the country, and hopefully several hundred thousand more coming up uh, in Wisconsin now that right, uh, right to carry is exactly. in effect. And again, that hasn't been a problem. Right. It hasn't been a problem. It's not going to be a problem. And he just clearly doesn't understand what's going on. And, and yes, you know, once again, to his ignorance about the course and what concealed carry means and what actually defending yourself in, a, in your own home and with a firearm means. Yes, during the course, they, they teach you to shoot in a lethal area because that's the way it has to be done. Mm -hmm. it's, it's me or you, buddy. 
And that's the way it's going to go down. They're either going to kill you or you're going to kill them in your home. And you have to make that decision. And a lot of the time, some of these court cases don't come out in favor of the person of self-defense because they didn't meet the criteria. Right. But the majority of the time, you know, as you know, more guns in America save lives every year by a vast majority than cause harm. Absolutely. Katie, always a real pleasure to have you in studio. Thanks for coming in tonight. No problem. Glad to be here. Katie Pavich with townhall.com. She'll be back with us again soon, I'm sure.